Welcome to Mount Prospect Public Library's Library Life. I'm Kathy Cushing. Today we'll peek in on a family science clubhouse concentrating on crazy chemistry. We'll also celebrate Mother Nature as we discover the astonishing beauty and wisdom of wildflowers. And we'll enjoy a Super Saturday Blues concert demonstrating the evolution of this extraordinary music genre. But first, believe it or not, this is Library Life's 200th show and we're reminiscing with a quick review of some of our most memorable moments. Welcome to Mount Prospect Public Library's Library Life. I'm Kathy Cushing. Today we're going to be That's how it all began nearly 17 years ago. On September 20th, 2001, Library Life launched its first episode. At that time, the nation was in stunned mourning over the devastating events of 9-11 and our library was on the cusp of change. Within a year, voters passed a $20.5 million referendum to renovate the library's 30-year-old structure. And in September 2004, patrons were thrilled with their new two-story, state-of-the-art facility. Like the services and programs offered at the Mount Prospect Public Library during this time, Library Life never missed a beat. Our magazine-style format followed the library through its quest for a new facility, its temporary move to the Kensington Business Center during renovation, where it seamlessly served our community, and of course, we were there for the fanfare of the main library's grand reopening. Almost entirely shot on location at the Mount Prospect Public Library, the history of library life reflects the modern growth of this library as well as our community. Library Life's MPTV production facilities were originally located in the old Village Senior Center, which incidentally was the site of this community's first library building in 1950. Mount Prospect Village Hall now stands at that location. It is the permanent home of MPTV, as well as Library Life's editing bay and its recently updated set. Through 200 Library Life programs, I have had the privilege of interviewing nearly 100 authors. Some have well-known mystery series to their credits, like New York Times best-selling author Mary Kubica, while others are popular writers for young patrons, like teen favorite Chris Crutcher and prolific children's author Candace Fleming. Among the scores of authors, Holocaust survivor Estelle Glazier Laughlin stands out as one of the most inspirational, sharing her hauntingly real autobiography, Transcending Darkness, with us. The cultural diversity of our community and its appetite for entertaining and informational library programming inspire the wide spectrum of stories captured each month on Library Life. Musical showstoppers like the Legacy Girls and WDCB's Jammin' in the Stacks, coupled with the colorful educational components of October's annual cultural series, the how-to lure of adult crafting, and the invaluable benefits of technology tutorials. This is just a brief sampling of the 800 library programs featured in past Library Life episodes, demonstrating the scope of service provided to a wide variety of interests and age groups. This year, the Mount Prospect Public Library is celebrating its 75th anniversary, and Library Life is proud to be part of the stellar history of this community gathering place. We are honored to be one of the vehicles by which the main library and the library's south branch reach out to those at home, a liaison between our library staff members and the folks who benefit from their expertise. A warm and heartfelt thank you to our viewers and all those who have contributed to the success and longevity of this award-winning show. 
Happy 200 Library Life. Nature has been the inspiration of poets, scientists, educators, perhaps all of mankind since our humble beginnings on this fair planet. Joining me today on Library Life to discuss his library program, The Astonishing Beauty and Wisdom of Wildflowers, is botanist and the director of environmental studies at Lake Forest College, Dr. Glenn Adelson. Welcome. Thank you so much, Kathy. I'd like to begin our discussion by talking about your background in the field of botany. I uh, started to fall in love with wildflowers just after uh, my undergraduate career. I was an English major and undergraduate, uh, but I took some botany courses in order to prepare myself uh, to go to graduate school and get a PhD mm -hmm. in uh, organismic and evolutionary biology. Uh, and I began working uh, on the milkweeds uh, mm -hmm. as part of my PhD work. Uh, I taught botany courses throughout my career. I came to Lake Forest College uh, nine years ago, and I spent the first couple years developing the core courses, and then once those were in place, I went back to my first love, which was teaching field botany. Now, why do you feel it's important to study the diversity and evolution of plants? It's important for people to know who they share the earth with. Mm -hmm. uh, all of life, or all of terrestrial life anyway, including mm -hmm. human life, uh, depends primarily on plants. Plants are the autotrophs. They're the ones who are the fixers of carbohydrate f using the energy of the sun. The process of photosynthesis provides two uh, products, and those two products are oxygen and food, mm -hmm. uh, the two most important things in the world other right. than sunlight and water. Mm -hmm. uh, and all of the rest of life depends on that. So the food chain uh, depends on plants, 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 we call them plants because they're planted. They can't move. Right. And because they're planted and can't move, they've developed all sorts of interesting secondary chemical compounds, mm -hmm. uh, which gives us flavors. Um, but it also creates medicines and creates poisons because what, from the plant's perspective, what the plant is doing is, is trying to encourage certain other animals, mostly insects, mm -hmm. but birds and sometimes mammals as well, right. um, encourage them to visit the plant for particular purposes like mm -hmm. pollination mm -hmm. and discourage them from visiting the plant um, in order to eat the leaves and eat the roots and things like that. Um, so uh, plants are important um, as the major ecosystem managers mm -hmm. uh, because everything else depends on what plants are there. Two years ago, while wrapping up an environmental studies uh, program that you were giving, you were inspired by a Wordsworth poem. Could you tell us a little bit about that incident and why you were inspired? To me, the meanest flower that blows can give thoughts that do often lie too deep for tears, is the last lines of Wordsworth poem. Uh, I was wrapping up a course uh, in which we talked about environmental degradation for the entire semester and I needed to end it with something more uplifting, more inspiring. And mm -hmm. I was inspired as I was about to teach that class by a beautiful spring wildflower bloodroot, uh, which has increased its population on our campus over mm -hmm. the nine years that I've been there. And I was inspired by the fact that this very fragile flower uh, was able to persist through um, decades of environmental degradation of asphalt and concrete poured on top of it. Mm -hmm. And I use that uh, as the conclusion for my course. Isn't that wonderful that something just comes into your head? It does, it does. Now let's talk a little bit about the sabbatical uh, trip that you took uh, that basically took you all over the world. Um, why did you decide to go on it and what did you find? I decided to go on it because I've been teaching field botany courses and as I teach field botany courses of course uh, I read about all of the other plants of the world uh, but I've learned over the years that just reading doesn't really teach you. Uh, so I decided I wanted to spend a year um, familiarizing myself with as many 
native wildflowers as I could in you the course of 12 months. Up close and personal. Up close and personal. So where did you go? I started in southern Africa. Uh, I went to Zimbabwe. I went to Zambia, South Africa, Lesotho, and Namibia. Mm -hmm. uh, I spent the first two months there. I came back and then I just started to drive to the American Southwest and things worked out perfectly because uh, this past spring, spring of 2017 in the American Southwest, there was what's, what's called a super bloom. Wow. Uh, California, as you probably know, had been in a drought for five or six years right. uh, and they finally got rain at a time that was perfect for the germination of the wildflowers. So what were some of the species that you found in the American Southwest? Oh, in the American Southwest there were wonderful things. There's uh, uh, the Desert Five Spot, which uh, the people at the uh, State Park told me was the, the Holy Grail of, <laughs> of um, botany, and it's a beautiful flower. It's uh, related to a hibiscus. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. I saw a lot of milkweeds. I had studied milkweeds uh, for in graduate school, and I love milkweeds. There's mm -hmm. a lot of desert milkweeds, and there's also milkweeds of um, uh, wetter areas. Right. I continued through Arizona and Southern California and then up to Alaska. Mm -hmm. And um, I spent a good deal of time in Alaska. I went to Denali National Park uh, and there uh, I saw the um, Arctic forget-me-not, which is the state flower of Alaska, as well as um, grizzly bears and uh, <laughs> moose and a lot of other uh, wonderful charismatic animals. And then I drove I drove back from the Pacific Northwest to Chicago and made many stops uh, along the way in, in Glacier National Park, in Banff National Park in Canada, and just uh, followed the late spring and early summer back to Chicago. Then I went to Europe. Okay. Uh, and I spent wonderful time in um, the uh, west coast of Ireland and the west coast of England. Uh, probably the single thing that um, blew me away the most was I was just walking down a path through sh shrubs mm -hmm. and turned the corner and I was just exposed all at once to the moor in bloom mm. in July. Oh it's just purple. Three different species of heather uh, all in flower at once just covering the landscape right at land's end. Uh, it was a beautiful sight. I bet. This is sort of like a, a a dream trip for it you, is isn't it? It is an absolute dream. It's, I didn't want it ever to end. So what else did you So see? then I went back to South Africa, because when I was there the first time, uh, a lot of the botanists told me, you need to come back in September, uh, because that's when things are really crazy in mm -hmm. bloom. And so I saw uh, a spectacular diversity of plants in the iris family that were all in bloom in mm -hmm. South Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Moreas are the names of, of those flowers. Uh, and then I came back to the Chicago area to capture some more pictures of what's in bloom in Chicago and finally concluded my year in Australia uh, and saw a, a large diversity of wildflowers in Australia as well. My goodness, and your photos are absolutely stunning. Did you take all those photos? I took all those photos, yep. My goodness. All right, so we obviously have seen the beauty of wildflowers. Yeah. What is the wisdom that wildflowers impart? Uh, the wisdom, there are a number of things that wildflowers impart to us. Um, the beauty is part of it, but there's wisdom in the beauty. Uh, it, it teaches us that beauty preceded uh, humans. Uh, these flowers had to become beautiful to insects and other pollinators in order to attract them. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think even more astonishingly, the flowers show that metaphor existed before humans. Mm -hmm. What flowers are is a metaphor for the fruits that are to come, that this flower stands for that, the fruit. Mm -hmm. And those animals that could perceive this, that, were, that noticed flowers, and those early humans that noticed flowers, uh, were the ones who could survive longer because they would find the food before other animals and other humans could find it. And mm -hmm. so it um, became part of uh, the structure of our consciousness uh, to, be, to pay rapt attention to wildflowers. You mentioned earlier when we were talking about the Wordsworth poem 
uh, the destruction of the habitats of some of these flowers. Yes. What are we doing to restore these habitats? Well, it turns out that Chicago is one of the hot spots of the world for restoration ecology. Mm -hmm. This is something that started uh, in uh, Wisconsin back in the 1940s and was really picked up in Chicago in the 1970s. The greater Chicago area is an area where a number of different habitats meet. There's forest, there's savanna, mm -hmm. there's prairie, there's wetlands, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, especially the prairie part of it. Uh, people started to work to restore areas that had been taken over uh, not areas, you can't really restore areas that have buildings and asphalt, but a lot of the um, forest preserves and uh, state parks and municipal parks had just been left to become overgrown mostly with non-native plants. Mm -hmm. And people have worked really hard uh, to remove those non-native plants, to encourage um, the native plants to come back. Sometimes you have to plant them but the most wonderful times is when they just come back on their own. All this sounds so encouraging. Any yes. final words with regard to the beauty and wisdom of wildflowers? Yes, uh, I, I would say that the most important thing I learned, the, the, most, the deepest thought that's too deep for tears that mm -hmm. I discovered during uh, my sabbatical and my year chasing wildflowers is that no matter how much we try, we can never annihilate the beauty of the earth. Perfect. Thank you so much for being with me today. Thank you, Kathy. For more information on the astonishing beauty and wisdom of wildflowers or any upcoming Mount Prospect Public Library event, contact the library at area code 847-253-5675 or visit our website at www.mppl.org. Young patrons here at the Mount Prospect Public Library have ample opportunity to explore the elements of STEAM, science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics. Let's step into the Family Science Clubhouse where we'll be treated to a hefty helping of crazy chemistry. A new series of events here at the Mount Prospect Public Library brings families together for an evening of fun, laughter, and science experiments. Family Science Clubhouse is our, our new version of the program we used to do called Mad Scientist Club Junior. We found that the, the littler kids, the kindergarten to second grade, were, were having trouble with just our staff helping them. So we wanted to be able to do more fun experiments, more messy experiments, more hands-on experiments with the kids. So we figured why not bring the whole family in and have parents involved. Um, the whole family can get excited about science that way. On this particular Thursday evening, parents and their children are learning about crazy chemistry via three hands-on experiments. First, we're going to do a little demonstration for them about acid-base testing with cabbage juice, something that they'd easily be able to do at home with simple ingredients around the house. And then they get to do something we're calling exploding apples, which is our new take on the erupting volcanoes you do with baking soda and vinegar. Instead, they get to turn it into a little apple and make their apple explode. We also have then something called milk galaxies, where it's just a very simple experiment with milk, food coloring, and dish soap. And lastly, they get to make fluffy slime. We thought it was great. I mean, it was a lot of fun. We got to learn about chemistry, learn about chemical reactions, get our hands dirty, and, um, play. and we made some slime to take home. We didn't really know what to expect, but uh, I love chemistry and he loves math, so we thought what a great thing for us to do together and it really was so much fun. It was a fun time with the kids. Um, they obviously enjoyed it and they uh, really had a good time learning about the different science aspects of it, so it was nice. I think the number one benefit is being excited about science and really having that hands-on experience when you're young kind of sparks that interest and then keeps it going. You actually get to do stuff like fun and like you get to feel the fluffiness of the slime a lot in the experiment. I remember back to when I was a kid and I did experiments like this with my family. You can do them at home but not every home knows how to do them so we provide that and having the family come really nurtures that and really helps the kids. Slowly squeeze it. 
Our number one goal is to get kids to come to the library and to be excited about the program. So if they can come in and have a smile on their face at the end of it, we've met our goal. Um, it would be great if it piques their interest and they want to explore the collection more and check out some nonfiction books on the topic, because um, there's a lot of great experiments. For more information regarding future Family Science Clubhouse events, contact the library at area code 847-253-5675 or visit our website at www.mppl.org. Each episode of Library Life features best book recommendations from library staff members, enabling them to share literary advice with our television audience. Now here's Youth Programming Coordinator Erin Emmerich with her best book pick from this department. How do you camouflage a huge cargo ship traveling in the middle of the ocean? You can find out in Chris Barton's new book, which explains how Britain used an unusual and colorful idea to help them win a war. The book Dazzle Ships, World War I and the Art of Confusion begins by setting the scene. It was 1917, amid World War I, and people on the island of Britain were starving. They relied on ships to bring food and supplies, but Germany's U-boats kept sneaking up and torpedoing the ships. The British Royal Navy was growing desperate. Perhaps that's why they listened when Lieutenant Commander Norman Wilkinson presented a wild idea. It was impossible to paint a ship so that it could not be seen by a submarine, so Wilkinson proposed the opposite. Paint colorful patterns to break up the form and confuse the submarine as to which direction the ship is heading and at what speed, making the ships more difficult targets. Amazingly, this worked. Britain went on to paint over 2,000 Dazzle ships during the war with many different patterns. This book brings the Dazzle ships to life in a way that even photographs can't, since photos at the time were in black and white. You will enjoy the vibrant illustrations while learning a piece of fascinating history. Recommendations from the Youth Services Department this month highlight art and architecture. Her Right Foot by Dave Eggers delivers a powerful message of acceptance while investigating the existence of a seemingly small trait in the foot of the Statue of Liberty. Keith Herring, The Boy Who Just Kept Drawing by K.A. Herring describes the real-life journey of a famous artist as told through the eyes of his sister. Falling Water, the building of Frank Lloyd Wright's masterpiece by Mark Harshman guides readers through the creative process of an American architect and his design of a house sitting perched atop a waterfall. Maya Lin, Artist Architect of Light and Lines by Jean Walker Harvey, is the inspiring biography of the woman who was destined to design the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C. And The World is Not a Rectangle, a portrait of architect Zaha Hadid by Jeanette Winter, is the true story of a child who grew up in Baghdad and went on to design buildings all over the world. Recommendations from the Adult Services Department this month deal with illness and loss. In A Partial History of Lost Causes by Jennifer Dubois, a woman travels to Russia to find answers after she discovers a letter from her deceased father to an internationally renowned chess champion and political dissident. Set in 1955, The Sweetest Alleluia by Elaine Hussey centers around a dying woman who takes out a want ad in search of a loving mother to care for her daughter. In Mimi Malloy at Last by Julia McDonnell, a woman was come to terms with her future after learning the disappointing results of her MRI. My Sister's Keeper by Judy Picoult follows one girl's legal fight for the right to make decisions about her own body, knowing she was originally conceived to provide bone marrow for her leukemia-stricken sister. And in Did You Ever Have a Family by Bill Clegg, a woman struggles to accept unthinkable loss as an entire community reels from the circumstances of her tragedy. Finally, let's find out what administration's Patty Griffin has chosen as her best book pick from the Adult Services Department. Are you looking for an easy read that you won't be able to put down? 
My recommendation for you is called Inside the O'Briens by Lisa Genova. It's a beautifully written story about what it's like to be diagnosed with a fatal degenerative disease, how you react, how you move forward, how the medical costs are crippling, and how the disease impacts everyone around you. It's an emotional read, but it takes you from despair to hope and humor as you consider your own immortality. Joe O'Brien, our main character, is a Boston police officer. He's funny and he's real. His view of a cop's world in the years since the Boston Marathon bombing is enlightening to the struggles of all those who serve. You'll also see the internal turmoil of Joe's friends, his wife, and his four adult children, all of whom may face the same fate as their father. Hollywood's going to be releasing the movie of this beautiful story next year, but I strongly encourage you to read the book first. You will cry, but you'll laugh too, and you'll gain a true understanding of Huntington's disease and other illnesses like it. The fun-filled family events featured in this library's monthly Super Saturday series are a reoccurring part of the Library Life lineup. Let's take in a blues concert designed to educate as well as entertain. I hate to see the evening sun go down. Rutland Jackson is an entertainer on a mission, teaching his audience how to appreciate the origins and evolution of the blues. When I do these workshops, I start around the 1850s and I get into the DNA of the blues and the, the musical styles that made up the blues in the first place and when it began to emerge in our culture. The blues was not brought over, it emerged right here in the U.S in the southern states on these big farms that we call plantations. And it is made up of field hollers, work songs, and religious music that fuse together around the turn of the century and then someone start referring to it as the blues. An author, storyteller, and oral historian, Jackson weaves acoustic blues and traditional folk songs into a presentation that is teeming with material outlining the birth of this American-made music genre. I've been doing these programs for uh, over 20 years. I sort of have to force feed this information in there so that when they walk out of that door, if someone should ask him what the blues is, why it's important, and where it came from, that they should be able to tell them without taking notes. I have two baskets and a a Chicago-based acoustic guitarist and singer who has been a leader in facilitating award-winning Blues in the Schools programs, Jackson goes on to explain the different styles of blues and how the blues have affected popular music over the years. They call the blues the poor man psychologist because you can express yourself. There's a timeline that, of history that goes through blues music. It's American history. Okay, and uh, it's the one true art form that was not brought over. Okay, American classical music is jazz, European classical music is Beethoven and Bach. And they, immigrants came over here, but the blues emerged right here, and we think that that's a good thing. Super Saturday's blues concert with Fruitland Jackson is just one example of the many entertaining, informational, and educational events featured here at the Mount Prospect Public Library every month. Don't miss any library programs you'd like to experience. Here's a list of events scheduled in April and May. Reservations are strongly recommended. For more information regarding these events, call area code 847-253-5675 or visit our website at www.mppl.org. You will also find a listing and description of all upcoming Mount Prospect Public Library events in your library newsletter preview. Earlier in the program, we visited with a botanist who spoke about the astonishing beauty and wisdom of wildflowers. With this in mind, our Library Live camera today asked the question, what is your favorite type of flower and why? Here are some responses. 
My favorite flower is the lavender because pur it's purple and purple is my favorite color and also it smells really nice and everything that's lavender scented is very calming and it's, it's just good for your soul. It's the hydrangea because it blooms all summer, comes in pink and, and blue and requires very little care. Our favorite flower is a rose because it smells so nice. That wraps up the 200th edition of Library Life. For more information on any of the Mount Prospect Public Library services and events highlighted here, call area code 847-2535-675 or visit our website at www.mppl.org.